Hey family, welcome to the Father's House OC. My name is Eric and we're so glad you decided to join us today. Here's what we need you to do. Grab your Bibles, iPads, notebooks, pens, and get ready for a powerful message. And don't be shy, share this message right now with a few friends. Thank you and enjoy the message. I am so honored that you've chosen to spend this holy day with us. And here uh, for family visiting from Tucson to my friends visiting from the UK. Hello, Governor. Yes, they're from London and they're up in here for our online family. Put in the chat box where you're watching from and we have a seat at the table for you. This concept of having a seat at the table is one that I've been actually inherited since I was a kid. Uh, this week in North America, in the United States specifically, it's a holiday that we refer to as Thanksgiving. And basically we come together and we are with friends and we are with family and we indulge in delicious food and we celebrate what we are grateful for. We celebrate what we're thankful for. And now I am the daughter of immigrants. So Thanksgiving in our home was always a little eclectic and I just thought that was normal. Like I remember one Thanksgiving, my dad decided he was gonna do uh, wonton soup and egg rolls for Thanksgiving. And I just thought that was normal until I married my white Midwest husband and he came over for Thanksgiving and we didn't even have a turkey that year. He was so grieved, like he, it was like he was saddened over the fact that we didn't have a turkey. So the next year uh, we were married and I told my mom, okay, we have to do American food for Matt. So my mom didn't know, she said, okay, I'll make a turkey. Bless her heart. She pulls out this golden brown, beautiful turkey, but she didn't know you had to defrost the turkey. So we went to go cut it, and that was year number two that Matthew Ray Oltoff did not get turkey. So year three of us dating, being in a relationship, we're married now, we got turkey. My dad made the turkey. He defrosted it, he seasoned it, he baked it, pulled it out, this 14 pound bird of delicious goodness, and it fell out of the oven and rolled on the floor. After that, Matt and I hosted Thanksgiving and still to this day host Thanksgiving in our house. But I've always wanted to have a traditional American meal, but I grew up in a family where we had family dinners often. So it, it, Thanksgiving just felt like another day where we give thanks because we give thanks every single day. But that year I said, you guys, we have to be fancy. This is what Americans do. We get dressed up. So my bar was real low. I said, everyone has to wear shoes to the dinner table, okay? I want us to get dressed up. We are gonna give thanks and we're gonna look good doing it. Well, usually my dad wears like loose sweats and like a t-shirt if we're lucky. Most of the times he's chestless at the, you know, shirtless and his chest is exposed to the dinner table. That year, my dad went upstairs and came down in a suit. He looked good. But I mean, HTT, head to toe, he rolled up, he had slacks, he had a sports coat, he had a white crisp shirt with a tie on, and all of us were astounded. Oh my gosh, you look so good, Dad, that's amazing. He said, let's stand and gather hands so we could pray. And there was a pause, and he said, well, I'm a little hot, let me take off my jacket. He took off his jacket, and my dad had cut the shirt, so it was just a bib of his white shirt and a tie. My dad's got jokes, y'all, okay? And my sad heart was broken yet again. We cannot be fancy if my family tried. But you know what that has taught me being raised in my household? It don't matter how you show up, what you wear, or even what you eat. There is a seat at the table, and there's power at the table. I'll tell you there's power at the table because conversations are had, covenants are made, and lives are changed. Now, if you don't believe me, um, this ethos that I developed even as a kid has matriculated into even starting this church. Matt, for those that know, he is a level three sommelier. And when he was going through his training, uh, sommelier is a wine expert. And as he was going through his training, I started asking questions like, hey, what are you going to do with this? Like, what are, really, what, how are you going to use this? And so I said, we should do dinner parties and, you know, wine education and bring people around the table. And so we started, and there was this one particular girl, she'd come three or four times to the dinner parties, and I remember um, having interesting conversations with her. Now, I ain't one to judge, but I will inspect some fruit. You know what I'm saying? Based on her colorful language, her four-letter words that were not love, uh, her stories, her clothing. One time she rolled in, her top was nothing more than a ball of yarn, and I was like, oh, bless God, all right, welcome, all right, great. So imagine my shock as we're sitting across from the table from each other. And she said, I love my church. I said, oh, really amazing. You go to church. What church do you go to? She said, here, this is my church. That night, Matt and I were going to bed. I crawled into bed kind of laughing, recounting the story. I said, oh, she said, this is her church. And Matt just deadpan face said, B, I think we're starting a church. I said, I think you're lying. I think you're crazy because we are not starting a church. But what we have discovered 
is that there is conversations that happen at the table. New covenants are formed and lives are transformed. Now, I, I know this because the conversation and the dinner that we're going to take a look at today in Mark chapter 14 does exactly that. Now, pause for a second. For those that have been with us, I am so proud of this church. This is the longest series we've ever done. We are going chapter by chapter through the book of Mark. And um, I just by a show of hands, by a show of hands, how many have been here or have watched Mark 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and now 14. Raise your hand. <gasps> oh my gosh, for those online, this is a Bible teaching, Bible believing church and the saved, sanctified saints are making me proud today. I pray an extra anointing upon you. I pray that your thighs don't touch and your children don't smell. I pray that your house is clean and your car has gas. I pray that you grow an inch and lose 10 pounds this week. That's the blessing that you get because you're in the word, child. And for everyone who hasn't participated, it's all good. I got love for you. I ain't got no blessing for you, but I got love for you. You can watch on YouTube. All right. Well, Mark chapter 14 was the homework for this week. And this chapter is chock full of goodness. Okay. It's so good that if you didn't do your homework this week, you have another week to catch up because we're going to do Mark chapter 14, another portion next week. So open up your Bible and turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Now, I'm actually going to read the end of this passage to give you a context. I'm going to let you know in the beginning where we're going. I want to finish with the end in mind. I will let you know straight up that this is a passage about communion, about communion. And so let's put this text in some context. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it. This is my body. And then he took the cup, and he gave him thanks. He gave it to them, and they all drank. This is my blood covenant, which is poured out for many. When they had sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Today, in this house, the first time, if I'm not mistaken, the first time since the pandemic, we are going to partake in the Lord's Supper communion today in this moment uh, the word communion, like if you hear communion, maybe you don't come from a church background or this might feel foreign or new to you. The word communion is this. It is a sharing or exchanging of ideas or feelings. And that's what happens at the Lord's table. And the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that most people don't understand communion or the Last Supper. But you know what this is? It's an invitation to dine with Jesus. It's an invitation to sit and sup with Jesus. Jesus cares about the table. The title of today's message is Come and Sit at the Table. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay. I love that my God loves a good dinner party. I mean, I don't know about the God that you serve, but my God, Jesus, he loves a good dinner party. In fact, in the book of Luke, we read that Jesus was either going to a dinner party, at a dinner party, or leaving a dinner party, okay? Jesus loves to dine. In fact, for the word nerds and Bible scholars, Ephesians, or excuse me, of Revelation 3.20 says this, here I am, I stand in the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and what? I will eat with that person and they with me. Jesus wants you to have a conversation at the table with him. Why? Because there's power in the table. At the table, conversations are held, covenants are made, and lives are transformed. If you're unfamiliar with this word covenant, it's a promise. It's an intention. It's, it's a I vow to you. Now, I love what the Bible scholar N.T. Wright says about this moment. He says this, and it's on the screen. When Jesus himself wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was about, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. So today I want to serve up some soul food. Now some of y'all are thinking like green beans and chitlins and collards. I'm not talking about that kind of soul food. Thank you, Coco. Coco likes that. There'd be no fried chicken up in here. The soul food I'm talking about is going to the core ethos. Our values are inside. And that's the soul food I want to serve up. So for those that are watching online, whether this is midweek, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, uh, whether you are watching on podcasts, this is what I want you to do. I want you, no matter where you are, to grab your communion elements now. It could be a piece of bread, a wafer, a cracker, uh, some juice, some water, some Jesus juice if you're at liberty, whatever it is. But I'm telling you, we want you to partake with us even in this moment. God's presence is with us in all places and stations and locations, and we are going to dine together. So let's get back to some context for this conversation. You are in Mark chapter 14, but boop, 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 
go up to verse 12. We're going to pick this up. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, what is this? Here's a little clue. It's the holiday Passover, okay? When it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb. Ooh, Mark is giving us some details. Mark is giving us some clues in this moment. Note the detail of the lamb because we're going to come back and visit it. Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? The Passover. Now, most of y'all are Gentiles in here, but me, as a 1% Jew, I'm going to tell you a little bit of Passover history. Now, if you were with us in the Have You Heard series on the Holy Spirit, I did a, I did a sermon on uh, Passover and Pentecost. But today, I want to crack it open just a little bit more because it will help us understand the meaning and the weight and the glory of the meal that we're about to partake today. So in Exodus chapter 12, this is the very first Passover meal. And it is called Passover because death was going to pass over the children of Israel. This was going to be the final act of their freedom because the children of Israel had been enslaved for under for over 400 years under the oppressive hand of Pharaoh. They have been tirelessly and mercilessly worked to the bone. They have cried out to God and God turned his ear towards them, his loving eye towards them and is about to bring them freedom. But God gave them very specific instructions. The instructions were take the blood of a lamb and put it on the doorpost. Put it on the doorpost and that would be a sign that death would pass over my people. And those who were in the house where the blood covered the doorposts, their lives were spared. There is power in the blood of the lamb. They were protected under the blood of the lamb. That night, as death was passing over the houses of Egypt, they ate a meal of roasted lamb, sweetness of a roasted lamb. And there they ate it with flat bread, which we understand kind of to be like a matzah because there was no time for the bread to rise. They're about to leave. They're about to get out of slavery. So the lamb, the flattened bread would be the main dish that would be served that night. But there was a side dish, a side dish of bitter and harsh herbs. Bitter and harsh herbs would represent the bitterness and harshness of years of slavery and oppression and bondage. And we served with salty water on top of the bitter, harsh herbs, representing the tears that were shed for the years that they were enslaved. Now, I, I, I think that there is something that is beautiful to note here, is that there was healing in this meal. The reason why I said that there was healing in this meal is because scripture is very clear. They put the blood on the post. They partake of the lamb. They partake of the bitter, harsh herbs. And they are leaving Egypt into freedom. And scripture includes, includes this note that they were not feeble, that they were not sick, and they were not weak. Over a million people left, not feeble, not sick, not weak. There was something beautiful. As death passed over the houses of the Egyptians and took the lives of the firstborn son, nothing happened to the children of God except they got healthy and they got freed. And not only that, they walked out of bondage and entered into some wealth because the Egyptians were giving them their silver, their gold, their jewels. They left freedom, they left bondage and they walked into, excuse me, they left bondage and they left slavery and stepped into freedom. And they were blessed with abundance. What is significant about this in the passage that we just read? I'm so glad you asked, Bible scholar. <sighs> because Jesus chose this day Jesus chose this day to gather his brothers, to gather the disciples and have a conversation at a table to give them a new covenant that their lives would be transformed. At a table, this is what happens. Now, in John chapter 1, we don't have time to go there, but for the word nerds, the Bible scholars, you might get the illusion here. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist sees Jesus. He sees Jesus in the distance, and he calls out this. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Ooh, do y'all catch that? What is John alluding to? 
the Passover lamb. It was the blood of that lamb that brought them out of bondage and out of slavery and into freedom. And it is the blood of this lamb, a.k.a. Jesus, that's going to bring us out of our bondage, us out of our slavery, us out of our sin, to step into a calling with God. That is why when, when the Israelites were slaves to Egypt, we read scripture and we know, thanks to the book of Romans, that we were slaves to our sin. We were dead to our trespasses. And now through the blood of Jesus, we can say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? There is an eternal destination for me, and it is not here on earth. That's when the Israelites ate their harsh and bitter and salty herbs. It was tamed by the sweetness of the lamb. We too, I, I don't know about you, I have tasted of the bitterness of life. When life doesn't go the way that you expect, the way that you want, the way that you anticipated, the way that you planned, the way that you hoped, but the harshness, the harshness of loss, the harshness of sickness, the harshness of death. What about the salty tears that we've cried? Have you cried tears of bitterness and of harshness? Let me remind you today that the bitterness and the harshness ain't nothing but a side dish. It is nothing but a side dish. Somebody say that's a side dish. And let me tell you something, those people that make green bean casserole and put canned condensed cream of mushroom soup, that's trash. That's a side dish we don't eat, okay? Because in my house, I don't make that. I don't care how American that is. I will not touch it. Everything in my house is fresh, and it has delicious herbs. And if there's bitter herbs, it's going to be tamed by something beautiful, okay? What the disciples didn't know at that time was that this was the last meal that Jesus was going to have with them. This was, uh, as you've been with us, you will know that this is the week of Jesus' crucifixion. This is Thursday night, and on Friday, Jesus is going to the cross to be crucified. He's having a conversation. He's giving, Jesus is giving his disciples everything. And let's see who has a seat at the table. Join me in verse 17. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they asked him, surely, surely you don't mean me. Lord, Lord, I know you're not talking to me. I would never betray you. I would never deny you. And Jesus is like, never, ever? And they replied, never, ever, ever. No, I will not. Never, ever, ever. I will not. Well, the interesting thing is, is that shortly after this, we will read about a man named Thomas who doubted Jesus. And then we know about a man named Peter who denied Jesus. And then we got James and John who were trying to be like Jesus. And then we have Judas who's about to betray him. Oh, Lord, is it I? Now, I don't want to still look at the disciples and think like, oh, they're so messed up. They're torn from the floor up. I would never. Oh, really? Because we do this in very different ways. Maybe you're in here today and you're like, I've been such a good oh, Christian. I love the Lord. I go to church. But my guys, we're going to go to Vegas. We're going to turn up because I need a little weekend. I need a little weekend where nobody knows me. I'm going to turn loose. Oh, really? Oh, really? Maybe you are a sanctified, saved, single woman in the house of God. And you're like, God, I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I would never, never date somebody who don't love you unless he got money. Okay? <laughs> Maybe you're here and you're like, oh, I, I, Lord, I will tithe. I will tithe. But I will tithe after Christmas because, you know, bills are expensive. No, 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 no. We can come to the table with our doubt like Thomas. We can come to the table with our betrayal like Peter. We can come to the table like James and John with our comparison. We can come to the table even with our betrayal and denial much like Judas. And guess what? The Lord serves us as the Lord serves them. Not only did Jesus prepare a table for these jokers, one detail that, 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 that is included, that Mark excluded, but John included. In John 19, it's the, 19, it's the same passage, it's the same scenario, it's the same narrative that's going on, it's the Last Supper. But John includes this detail that Jesus stooped down low and did a job of the least in the household, the lowest slave, and that is to wash the stanky, crusty, nasty feet of the disciples. Get that in your mind. The Lord, oh Lord, the King of Kings is stooped down low to wash the feet of the disciples. These are supposed to be his closest friends. And they were like hot mess express. But let me tell you something. Do you know that the Lord is in the business of doing the same thing even for us today? That he will take our, our dirty hands, our sinful thoughts, our putrid heart, and he will cleanse us, and he will serve us, and he'll create a seat at the table for us. Look at verse 22. 
While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. Then they took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my covenant of the blood, which is poured out for many, he said to them. We are told that this is the last supper, and there's only two ingredients that are listed here. Do y'all catch that? Bread and wine. Well, what's the missing component here? The lamb. Now, I find it interesting. Maybe they had it, but in all four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do you know that none of them include anything else except bread and wine? Speculation. But was it that the, the lamb was not on the table because the lamb of God sat at the table? Ooh, I don't know, but I'm looking at this. I'm kind of shook. See, it is at this table where something happens. This is the only act of our Christian faith that our, our, our active faith is made visible. See, all throughout scripture, we are told, we're told very, very clearly that, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And here at this table, in partaking of communion, you are invited to taste, to touch, to see, to sip, to smell, and to bite. This is the only act of faith that is connected to physical things that represent his body that is broken for us and his blood that is shed for us. We have a seat at the table to commune with God, and we get to thank him for his love, for his grace, for his mercy, for his kindness, for his joy, for his peace. We sit and we sup with God and we say thank you. In the same account, uh, Luke records this phrase of Jesus. For the note takers, you don't have to turn there. It's going to be on the screen. But in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, Jesus says this phrase, do this in remembrance of me. What is significant about this phrase? Well, thousands of years earlier, God established a covenant. Remember, I told you what a covenant was. It is a vow or a promise. And in Exodus chapter 6, at the Passover, uh, we are told what happens. I just recounted it earlier. Now, if you celebrate Passover today, there's going to be four glasses of wine on the table. I want to pull this back for a second because I feel like it weighs bearing when we understand a new covenant that Jesus gives us. The first cup that would partake there at Passover was the cup of sanctification. That means that God is saying, I have pulled you out and I have separated you. You are my people. The second cup that we see is the cup of deliverance where God said, I will deliver you. The third cup is the cup of redemption. Well, what does that mean? God is saying, I will redeem you. The fourth cup is a cup of acceptance. I will take you as my people. So Jesus at this meal, says a new covenant I give to you. I have sanctified you. You are my people. I have forgiven you. I have redeemed you. And you are mine. This is the present active participle. This is not, I had redeemed you. No, this is an every day I am currently redeeming you, calling you my own, forgiving you, and freeing you. He is constantly working at this. So when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, we are supposed to remember the goodness of Jesus. Jesus, I remember that you healed the blind man. Jesus, I remember that you welcomed the outsider. Jesus, I remember that you forgave the sinner. Jesus, I remember that you Welcome the unwanted. But then it's also a moment of reflection for us to remember what have I done that the blood of Jesus needs to be placed value over? Jesus, I remember how lost I was. Jesus, I remember how low I was. Jesus, I remember how forgotten I was. Jesus, I remember that I had so much and yet had nothing. Jesus, I remember how depraved my mind and my soul and my body was. Jesus, I remember. And for that, I say, thank you. I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for you, you, your life. I celebrate and this brings me joy. I have joy that his death has brought me life and his resurrection has brought me power. That is what I celebrate today. And this is a joyful meal that we're about to partake in. We are told in scripture that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And maybe you walked in here today and you feel weak. Partake of this meal. May the joy of the Lord be restored to you. And the beauty about this meal, this was a generational meal because they were taught, hey, there's going to be generations after you that will forget. They'll forget about how they were been freed. You know what communion is? Our chance to remember. To remember that we were once lost and oppressed. And today we stand in freedom because of the sacrifice of Jesus. 
if you are here alone, guess what? You get to partake in the family of believers, even online. You may not be here in this room, maybe in the video experience, but you are part of what God's doing here. Maybe you came with your spouse or a son or a daughter or a grandchild. This is the beauty about this moment is that you get to remember who Jesus is together with them. The opposite of the word remember is dismember. The word dismember means to pull apart. So in your family, if there is a disagreement, an argument, an issue that has dismembered you, partaking in communion will remember. Maybe you are sitting here today and it may not, you may not have an issue with a family member. Maybe you have an issue with a church member because this is the body of Christ. Maybe this is your moment to remember with them. Or maybe you are sitting in here and you feel dismembered because of sin or decisions that you have made today in the house of God. I encourage you to remember there's power in this meal. And as we partake of communion, we are celebrating and commemorating the death, the life, and the resurrection of Jesus. We partake of his body that is broken for us. And we partake of the cup, which is symbolic of his blood that was shed for us. Christ with us. Christ for us. Christ instead of us. That is communion. We approach knowing that Jesus has invited us to dine with him, to pull up a chair at his table. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter the decisions that we made, we get to have a seat at the table with God. I love in verse 26, it says that they sung a hymn at the end of that and they went to the Mount of Olives. In your hand, you should have your communion elements for those in this room, for those online. I want you to hold them in your hand and I don't want you to partake yet. I want us to wait because in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and they were abusing communion. People were getting lit and loaded off of communion. The community was a mess and Paul said, no, no, no. We have to reflect and ask God to forgive us. We cannot take communion in an unworthy manner. If there's sin in our life, if there's sin in our mind, if there's sin in our heart, today is the day that we remember and come close to God. So before we partake as a community, I believe that there's people in here who maybe have never heard about a man named Jesus and you want to have a seat at his table. Or maybe you know that you have been walking in blatant sin. At one point you were walking with the Lord. And I'm not talking about you made a mistake or you know had an attitude. I'm talking about you know you in straight up sin, but you want to come back and sit at the table and enjoy the Lord's Supper with him. If that's you, I'm gonna to count to three. I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand boldly and high for those online to put it in the chat box. But one, by raising your hand, you are saying, I believe that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Two, by raising your hand, you are saying, with my mistakes, my failures, my sin, as the Bible refers to it, is, is forgiven because of what Jesus did. Isaiah says that my sins were like scarlet, like red like scarlet, they be white as snow. And three, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave, as Romans tells us, is alive in me. So if that's you, and you are saying yes, or coming back to the faith, one, two, you raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. In the video experience, there's someone there that can see your hand online. There's a number that you can text. For those that raise their hands, let me just say, you have a seat at the Father's house. And it doesn't just stay here at this Father's house. We encourage you, take this peace, take this joy, take this forgiveness. This is just the beginning. This is a declaration. I want Jesus as my Lord. So with the communion elements in your hand, Darius is going to sing over us. I don't want you to stand. I don't want you to sing. I want us to reflect, to remember, God, if there is sin in my life, if there is sin in my heart, if there is sin in my mind, forgive me. I want to sit and dine with you. I want to commune with you. Heavenly Father, take this moment and move in a way that only you can. Amen. Yes, there's a place just for you for all our welcome at the table there's a place just for you no condemnation at the table there's a place just for you all are welcome at the table there's a place just for you no condemnation at the table, there's a place just for you. Give it to you, Lord. Give it to you.
give you all of my pain and I lay down my shame at your feet oh today but don't stop here if you enjoyed this message take a moment to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream if this ministry has impacted you in any way and you'd like to partner with us to continue to reach the globe you can click the giving link in the description below be sure to share this message with a friend and join us live at 9 a.m and 11 a.m pst on sunday we love you and you have a seat at the table